I want to thank everyone for coming and, and all the many people who are involved in inviting me here tonight. Um, I have to say I've, I've done a lot of speaking a, a, around the country and uh, this is the very first time I've ever was met at the airport by someone wearing a t-shirt with the image of my book. <laughs> So I have to say, I, I've been absolutely overwhelmed by the response here in Bend. It was, uh, this is an amazing community, and I, and I am absolutely, absolutely thrilled to be here. Thank you all for coming. When you're a writer, you spend a lot of time by yourself. And it's very disconcerting if you're fortunate as I've been to be published when you're then expected to get up in front of an audience behind a microphone and entertain people like a stand-up comedian after you've spent the, several, uh, the past several years locked in a closet writing your book. <laughs> and uh, I have to say that for me this doesn't come naturally at all. And uh, it was especially difficult for me with, with this book, my second novel, The World to Come, because the first time I ever was asked to uh, speak about this book in public, I had also just given birth. So I hadn't left my home in several weeks, I hadn't worn makeup in several months, hadn't worn high heels in about a year, and I was very, very nervous about this. And my fa family and friends, of course, told me to get out there and break a leg. And of course, what happened was on my way into this event, I actually tripped on the sidewalk and I broke my arm. <laughs> so if, if I make it off of this stage without any fractured limbs, I will consider this evening to have been a tremendous success. So I'm counting on all of you to catch me. I want to say a few words about becoming a writer and also about becoming a Jewish writer because those, I think, are the, the two things that, uh, that most interest people in, in asking about in the, uh, the book and, and my role in it, which I feel like is in some ways perhaps smaller than you might expect. Um, I, I became a writer because of several things that my parents did for me when I was growing up. And uh, if any of you are parents or grandparents of young children, I actually don't know that I would recommend any of these things. <laughs> Um, I, I, I come from a, a somewhat unusual family, starting with my parents who met in 1966 through the world's first computer dating service. So I am myself a, a product of modern technology. <laughs> yes, they are still married, in case you were wondering. Um, and, and we were a very unusual family. I'm one of four children, very close in age. And one of the things that was unusual about us is that we traveled a lot. Um, our parents took us on trips, um, not only perhaps to places where you might expect to take children, like to the beach or to Disney World, um, but to places where, of course, you would take four children, like Cambodia or Peru. It was sort of like it wasn't a family vacation unless everybody had to go get a shot first. So my, my parents very quickly realized that they needed some strategies to prevent us all from beating up the flight attendants on these long haul flights. So one thing that they told us when we went on these trips that, was that all of us were required to keep journals when we traveled. And I took this very, very seriously as I was growing up. And I really wrote down all of my impressions of all the places that we were visiting and all the things that we, we had experienced and, that, and, and what I thought of the places we went. And I'm actually now as an adult very grateful to my parents for having done this for me because I feel that most people would, would not even consider going to a place like Cambodia without bringing a camera. It just wouldn't even occur to you to go without a camera. And while pictures can show you what you saw and they can show you sometimes what you did, they can't show you how you felt. And so I'm very grateful to my parents for having uh, made me write these, keep these journals because I find that now I can go back and look at these journals and not only see, to see what it was like to be in China, but what it was like to be 12. So I'm, I'm often asked how, I, how I'm able to, in my novels to create uh, uh, characters who are children. And in fact, I'm fortunate that my answer is that it's quite simple, I can go and look it up. And for that, I have my parents to thank. Um, and, I, and I must say that this technique did work because both my sisters are also now published writers. Um, and my, my older sister is a journalist and working on a first novel, and my younger sister just sold her second novel. And uh, my brother used to keep sketchbooks, and he now is a, a professional artist. He's an animator for television. So it did really work in that sense. Um, but my parents also quickly realized that this strategy of having us keep these journals on these long-haul flights was less successful in terms of keeping us in control uh, under control, I should say, around the dinner table at home, where I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of sitting at a dinner table with uh, four children under the age of 12, but it's, it's not always the most pleasant uh, experience. And one of the unpleasant aspects of it is that everyone is always interrupting everyone else and no one ever can finish a sentence. So at one point, my parents got so upset by this that my mother came home from work with a big kitchen timer. And she put this timer down on the kitchen table and she said, from now on, each child will have five minutes to tell about his or her day, and anyone who interrupts that child will have time deducted. Well, there are several results of this policy, one of which is that I now speak very quickly. So, 
I apologize if, if your ears are having difficulty keeping up with my mouth, and that's totally my mother's fault. But an, another result of this policy was that my, my siblings were not going to put up with this idea that they couldn't offer their running commentary on everything that you said about your day at any given time. So one of my sisters found a brilliant solution, which is that she passed out index cards and pencils to everyone at the table. And people would then write down numbers and hold them up while you were speaking, <laughs> reading your day. So, you know, like your day gets a 2.3, your day gets a negative five, you know, sort of like at the Olympics. And, and I think that when people are holding up cards saying, while you're speaking, saying, your day stinks, it makes you very acutely aware of what it means to tell a story and keep an audience engaged. So these were a, a few things that my parents did to turn me into a writer. Like I said, I don't really know that I would recommend any of these things. I want to say a few words about becoming a Jewish writer, because I find that um, in, in the course of publishing um, The World to Come and also my previous novel, In the Image, which also deals with a lot of uh, Jewish historical themes, um, I found that I'm, I'm often I've often been invited to speak on panels with other writers um, in which I'm asked this question, do you consider yourself a Jewish writer? And I think there's a lot one can say about what makes uh, something a Jewish book. Um, the questions, uh, is, does it matter wh whether the writer is Jewish, whether the characters are Jewish, does it matter if there's something, something about the sensibility of the way the book is written or the events that happen in the book? And it, it can become a sort of fraught and, and difficult question for many writers. But I find that actually having done this many times, I now have an answer to this question of what makes someone a Jewish writer in America today, um, having uh, been uh, forced to answer this question on many different panels. And what I realized is that what makes someone a Jewish writer in America today is their likelihood of being asked to participate in a panel <laughs> during which they will be asked the question, do you consider yourself a Jewish writer? And so by this standard, I, I, I definitely qualify as a Jewish writer. But I have to say that, that as... Um, as, as, a, as, a, as someone who is not only uh, writing the, about these themes, but ha, um, is pursuing this academically, as, as you heard, I have a doctorate in Yiddish and Hebrew literature. Um, I look at this a little bit differently because um, one thing that you learn um, when, you are, uh, when you study Yiddish literature is that no one ever asked Sholem Aleichem, one of the greatest Yiddish writers who ever lived, no one ever asked Sholem Aleichem, do you consider yourself a Jewish writer? And while it seems kind of obvious, actually the reason that no one ever asked him that question is purely grammatical. Because if you ask that question in Yiddish, do you consider yourself a Jewish writer? It doesn't make sense because the word for Jewish in Yiddish is Yiddish. The word for the language and the, uh, and the religion, identity, the culture is the same word. So I think if someone were to ask Sholem Aleichem that question, do you consider yourself a Jewish writer? He'd kind of answer, well, duh. I'm writing in Yiddish. I'm a Yiddish writer. But what I think that is interesting about that is what it reveals about what Jewish literature used to be, and in some circles still is, which is that what makes someone a Jewish writer is not whether they themselves are Jewish or whether their characters are Jewish or whether somebody in the book is eating a bagel, but rather what makes someone a Jewish writer was whether they were writing in a Jewish language, whether that language is Hebrew or Yiddish or any one of, in fact, there have been 20 uh, Jewish languages that have been used throughout world history. Um, so, and it's, and it's, and it was, it was the use of the language that made someone a Jewish writer. And as someone who's very aware of these languages in my own, in my academic work and in my, and in my personal, in my personal life, um, I found myself in a unique position to bring this language, these languages, to a readership that wouldn't otherwise have access to them. Because I find that it, what, what, what's interesting about works that are written in these Jewish languages is that even when these works are um, secular novels, you know, novels that are not purporting to, purport to, to present a, a religious point of view, um, there's just something in the language that always is tied back to the, to the ancient roots of the religion in the Hebrew Bible and in all of the commentaries on the Hebrew Bible that followed it and that form the, the tradition of, of Jewish literature and Jewish life. Um, and I think that all languages, in fact, have a kind of ancient resonance to them. And modern speakers do not often hear it. I think when people um, speaking modern English say something like, go the extra mile, they don't realize that they're quoting the Gospels when Jesus says to his disciples, I will go one mile beyond where, where, the place where you will go. And I'm sure I'm 
getting that wrong. Um, but I think that, but you don't, in other words, you don't hear the religious resonances and the ancient resonances that are in the language that you speak. And, um, but in, in Hebrew and Yiddish, those resonances are, are, are not only very ancient, but very, very layered because um, the, so much of, of the Jewish tradition is, is a text tradition. This is a tradition where, which is based on a book. It's based on the reading of the Hebrew Bible and the interpretation of the Hebrew Bible um, and the way that each generation reinterprets the Hebrew Bible. So this is a, a, a tradition where every word really has these layers to it and, and different ways of understanding it over the course of centuries. And what I wanted to do in, in effect was to write a novel in English as though English were a Jewish language. In other words, to introduce these kinds of layers and resonances into the language of the book itself. Um, and I'll speak for, and I'm going to speak for, in, in just a moment about uh, all the various ways that I tried to do that in, and to bring those resonances to a new readership. As many of you know, this, this novel, The World to Come, is about an art heist. It's about the theft of a Chagall painting from a Jewish museum during a singles cocktail party. And if you're wondering where I came up with this ridiculous idea, I in fact saw it on the front page of the New York Times. This theft really did happen. In 2001, there was um, a big Chagall show at the Jewish Museum in New York City, where I live. And um, they had paintings on loan from galleries around the world. And one night they had a singles cocktail party and someone walked into this cocktail party and walked out with a million dollar painting by Marc Chagall. I read this story in the paper and I just thought to myself, what kind of person walks into a singles mixer and then walks out with a million dollar painting instead of someone's phone number? <laughs> and right there, I had the beginnings of the character who becomes the main character in this novel. Shortly after the book was published, actually, another story appeared in the newspaper, which was even stranger, and surely if I hadn't finished the book by then, I would have found some way to include it. In 1960, an artist friend of Norman Rockwell's bought one of Rockwell's paintings from the artist himself for $900. When he got divorced, when this friend of Rockwell's got divorced, the painting was given to he, the, the ch his children and he and his wife's children as part of the divorce settlement. And while the family owned the painting, it was exhibited all over the world on loan from them. In 2002, when this man went, uh, was ailing and went uh, to live in a nursing home, his children then gave the painting for safekeeping to the Norman Rockwell Museum in Massachusetts. But when their father died in 2005, the children discovered a false wall in their father's living room. I'm sorry, I could not make this up. <laughs> when they removed the false wall, they found the actual Norman Rockwell painting, which their father had been hiding there since the divorce so that his wife wouldn't get it. The painting, in fact, that had, been in, that had been exhibited all over the world in the intervening decades was, in fact, and, and which now hung in the Norman Rockwell, Norman Rockwell Museum, was, in fact, their father's forgery of Norman Rockwell's painting. <laughs> As I said, I cannot make these things up. This story, I think, and the story of the theft of the Chagall painting both raise a lot of interesting questions about what gives a work of art its value. Why, for instance, is the original so important to begin with, especially when the only reason that anyone has even heard of Norman Rockwell was because his work was mass produced by the Saturday Evening Post. And if it's authenticity that's so important, then why should that be a concern for artists like Rockwell and Chagall, whose works, although in very different styles, both try to recreate a kind of nostalgic world that probably never really existed in the first place. And in fact, whose works in trying to evoke this supposedly lost world, both end up veering uncomfortably close to kitsch. The question is really, how much of an, a work of art comes from the artist himself or herself? How much comes from the world the artist lived in? And how much comes from the audience that sees the work of art? I think these stories of forgery and theft are so compelling because they make us realize that the contribution of the artist to creating a work of art is in fact much smaller than we think. And that creative work is much more collaborative than we might expect. It's effect, in effect of a, a collaboration not only between the artist and the artist's audience, but also between the living and the dead.